Why News with William Theo and Darlene Basingan. Good evening. The alert for Mount Mayon Volcano in Albay was raised from level 3 to level 4 Monday. Here's why from Joanna. The Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, or FIVOC, said the volcano is experiencing intense unrest. The institute upgraded the alert level 4 just a few minutes after the volcano suddenly erupted thick ash column around noon, the highest level being 5. This means that a hazardous eruption is imminent. FIVOX describes Mount Mayon's earlier activity a volcanic eruption, followed by phyroclastic density currents and phyroclastic flow. In this state, the phyroclastic materials coming out from the volcano are considered too dangerous. Delicado ito dahil unang-una yung pyroclastic flow is umabot yan ng 1,000 degrees Celsius. Ano? 1,000 degrees Celsius siya. And uh, hindi ito... Uh, Kapag natamang, hindi, kung maabot ang kamanito, hindi mo ito matatakbuhan. The local authorities have evacuated residents nearby and expanded the alert area to 8 kilometers. There's no report of any chaos so far in the surrounding area. FIVOX explains that if before the possible eruption might only affect the southern part of the volcano, its imminent eruption may now affect even its northeast section or the areas of Tabaco, Santo Domingo and Legaspi City. With this, residents of the said towns are also told to evacuate. FIVOX explains alert level 4 means there is a huge possibility that the volcano will erupt within hours or days. Uh, which means that uh, we can expect a hazardous eruption within uh, hours or days. According to Albay Governor Al Francis Bichara, classes in all schools will be suspended in the entire province until further notice. The Department of Transportation also suspended the operation of the Legaspi City Airport due to the thick ashes spewed by the volcano. Around 2,000 families that live within the 8-kilometer extended danger zone are now fleeing into different evacuation centers in accordance to the advice of the local government offices and of VVOX. Joan Nano, UNTV News and Rescue, Legaspi. Meanwhile, Malacanang is set to release an executive order against contractualization in the first week of February according to the Department of Labor and Employment. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. Labor groups are expected to meet President Rodrigo Duterte in the first week of next month, says the Department of Labor and Employment or DOLE. DOLE Undersecretary Joel Maglunsod said in this meeting, the chief executive is expected to sign the executive order which will intensify the prevention of labor contracting in industries and companies nationwide. This was announced by Labor Secretary Silvestre Bello and was confirmed by Malacanang. The executive order on ENDO will be issued soon. I'm not sure exactly when, but um, I know that Secretary Bello mentioned that it was forthcoming. Aside from the issue of contractualization, the labor groups are also expected to raise the issue of wage increase to President Duterte in relation to the effects of the tax reform package. They will ask the president to increase the salary of workers. No, mayroon din silang uh, proposal na yung malipas doon sa mga wage increases, yung uh, wage subsidy, no? lalo na sa mga minimum wage earners. So isa din, nagbubukas din ang uh, Department of Labor and Employment na mapag-usapan yan. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. A consumer group files a petition in the Supreme Court to stop the implementation of the tax reform for acceleration and inclusion or train law. Mon Hokson will tell us why. The tax reform law is unconstitutional. This is the reason why a consumer group filed a petition before the Supreme Court to stop the implementation of the said law. In a 43-page petition, the Laban Consumer Incorporated appeals to the Supreme Court to issue a temporary restraining order against the train law. Laban Consumer President Vic Dimagiba says some provisions in the Constitution were violated by the train law itself 
and this will result in more sufferings for many Filipinos. Dimagiba adds that the reform in the income tax does not make sense because in it is the increase in excise tax of petroleum products. And with the increase in prices of oil products is the rise of prices of basic commodity, jeepney fare and more. Hindi po balance, hindi equity, hindi equitable ang trato sa mga low income at poor families. Dimagiba hopes that the Supreme Court justices will carefully study their petition. Meanwhile, one economist agrees in the argument of the consumer group. According to Ranilo Balbiran, the government must not impose higher taxes on oil products. Hindi sana ganun kataas yung tax sa petrolyo. Kasi lahat tayo apektado. Parang halos lahat ng ginagawa natin dito sa mundo, parang may langis. Uh, so, at connected sa langis. Yung iba naman, sana eh, mas matasa na yung tax. Gaya ng uh, tax doon sa tobacco, sa mga sigarilyo. Kasi, hindi naman yan talaga kailangan sa buhay. On the other hand, Balbiran believes that the train law will have a good effect on the economy in the long run. Balbiran sees that the country shifted from a consumption-driven to an investment-driven economy. This means that the administration wants to invest for the sake of the future of all Filipinos. The consumer group calls on the public to be watchful of the current administration. This is to ensure that the funds that will come from the tax reform will go to where it should be spent. Mon Hokson, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Several militant groups marched to the streets to commemorate the 31st anniversary of the Bloody Mendiola Massacre. Here's why from Rajela Dora. A thousand members of various militant groups called for justice for the 13 farmers who were killed by soldiers 31 years ago in Manila. The militant groups who are mostly farmers marched from the main office of the Department of Agriculture in Quezon City Circle to the historic Menjola in Manila where the alleged massacre took place. The wife of one of the massacred farmers, Teresita Arjona, says they have been calling for land reform ever since. Kami ay kumikilos no na humingi lang ng lupa pero ang isinalubong sa amin ni Pangulong Aquino ay bala. Wala pa nga po hanggang sa ngayon, kaya kasalukuyang mulit-muli kami babalik dito sa paanan ng Mindyola para hingiin at singilin ang diktadura na para mabuksan ang kaso at maparusahan ang mga may kasalanan. One of the survivors, former Agrarian Reform Secretary Rafael Mariano said, they tried to talk to former President Corazon Aquino before to air their grievances but to no avail. Aside from land reform, the militants are also against a proposed charter change and the recently passed tax reform law. They argue this will only make harder the lives of the poor. Magpapataw ng dagdag na buwis sa petrolyo, particular po sa diesel at gasolina na ginagamit ng mga magsasaka sa pag-aararo sa hand tractor. Mariano says, Shifting to a federal form of government will pave way to a 100% foreign ownership of lands across the country. Epito pa nga sa bawat sampung mga magkasaka natin sa ating bansa, walang sariling lupa. Ibubukas mo pa sa pagmamayari ng uh, lupa uh, para sa mga dayuhan. The administration previously said the effects of train law will only be minimal and temporary as it will resort to long-term developments that will help improve the country's economy. Rajal Adora, UNTV News Rescue, Philippines. In other news, the French pharmaceutical giant Sanofi Pasteur vows to shell out funds for children proven to have become ill after receiving the Dengbaksha vaccine. Aiko Miguel will tell us why. In the course of the Senate inquiry today, the French pharmaceutical giant Sanofi Pasteur confirms it will shoulder all the expenses for the medical treatment of the children who have become ill after receiving Dengvaksha. It also vows to pay the relatives of the children proven to have died due to the controversial vaccine. As a father of three children, uh, I completely sympathize with any suffering. As a father, I've seen a lot of the media reporting recently uh, shown with uh, allegations and uh, photo montages, uh, and these are sickening to me. We will shoulder costs okay, of any 
death or adverse event that are causally related to vaccination. Present during today's hearing were the personalities and officials of the Department of Health or DOH with knowledge on the process, purchase and administration of Dengvaxia vaccines to Filipino children. Among them were former Health Secretaries Enrique Ona, Janet Garin and Dr. Pauline Ginobial, World Health Organization or WHO Country Representative Dr. Gondo Weiler also attended the hearing. It can be recalled that the forensic experts from the public attorney's office conducted an autopsy on the cadavers of the children who died several months after receiving the Vaksha. While the experts from the UPPGH are examining the cases of other children whose deaths are also being linked to the anti-dengue vaccine. Some parents of the alleged affected children also appeared during the Senate's inquiry today to call for justice and aid for their children. One of them was Ian Kulite whose child died last year after completing the three doses of Dengvaxia. Yung anak ko yung positive sa dengue, pero ang kinasama ko na po ng loob, bakit po tinago nila yung resulta ng X-ray ng anak ko, yung dugo, lahat po ng test tinago po, hindi po sa aming binigay. Gemma Evangelista is worried due to the various illnesses being contracted by her 11-year-old daughter. Kung ano yung naramdaman niya sa naranasan ng anak niya, ganun na po yung nararanasan ko ngayon. Buhay pa yung anak niya? Opo, oh. hinihimatay na po siya. Three times na po siyang hinihimatay. Hinahang, hinihimatay. Natatakot lang po ako kasi baka yung case ng anak niya mangyari po sa anak ko. The panel of experts assures that they will immediately release the real cause of the deaths of the children whose deaths were being linked to the Vaksha. For his part, former Health Secretary Enrique Ona said he never commended the use of Dengvaxia for the country's immunization program, knowing that it was not yet proven effective. Ona also denies being with former President Aquino in Beijing in 2014 to meet with Sanofi. I look over my, uh, my passport because oh, there was this insinuation that I was with the President in Beijing. Wala po yun. I was not So you were there. never with the President? The committee will resume its hearing on the issue on the 6th of February at 10 in the morning. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. Rappler Chief Executive Officer Maria Reza today faced the National Bureau of Investigation over a cyber libel complaint. Meanwhile, an IT expert says the complaint may have effects on other bloggers and companies. Roderick Mendoza will tell us why. Rappler CEO Maria Ressa appeared at the National Bureau of Investigation Cybercrime Division today on a cyber libel complaint. Ressa says while they were given the opportunity to answer the complaint, she still sees another motive behind it. She thinks the timing is suspect because the probe was set after the Securities and Exchange Commission revoked their license. Obviously, I still see this as part of a continuing pattern to harass uh, or and to shut down Rappler. Uh, I still see it as part of a concerted effort that will have impact on press freedom in the country. She assures that Rappler is ready to face all complaints and cases which may be filed against them. We appeal to government authorities to do the right thing, to follow the rule of law, to give us due process, we have nothing to hide. We'll completely submit ourselves as I did today. The cyber libel complaint was filed by businessman Wilfredo King last December over an article Rappler published in May 2012. Said article was about then Chief Justice Renato Corona using King's SUVs but also contained the businessman's alleged involvement in human trafficking and drug smuggling. While the article was written before the enactment of the anti-cybercrime law, it was updated by Rappler in 2014. Hence, the complainant argued that it could be qualified as a cyber libel. But IT expert and Rappler counsel, attorney J.J. Dicini, sees a defect in the complaint. The publication precedes what happened even before the law was, uh, was in existence. Uh, and therefore, it, it, um, it calls into question whether or not it could even apply in this case. He points out that it would be a big problem if this is affirmed since it would mean authors and publishers of decade-old articles could still be charged with cyber libel as long as these articles are accessible in the Internet. If that constitutes libel today, then, uh, then no one is safe. Anyone that has any libelous article 
uh, that continues to be accessible today may be charged with uh, with libel. And if moving forward, I mean, this affects everyone. Uh, this affects uh, all, not just media outlets, but also even bloggers, right? Uh, people who, who publish uh, some libel maybe 10 years ago, if it somehow it finds its way online. The NBI Cybercrime Division Chief says they will study the law's provision on this very carefully. Rappler was given 10 days to submit their answer to the complaint. As soon as magapag-comply sila ng affidavit na inihintay natin, uh, we will immediately evaluate the case and uh, submit recommendation. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. The Presidential Task Force on Media Security denies that now is the most dangerous time for journalists. Meanwhile, several media organizations call the SEC decision to cancel Rappler's license to operate as not commensurate response to the alleged violations of Rappler. My Bermudez will tell us why. The Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC's decision to cancel Rappler's license to operate, is not a commensurate response and a heavy punishment for the online news agency. Media organizations such as the Philippine Press Institute, or PPI, and the National Union of Journalists of the Philippines, or NUJP, believe that Rappler's nature as a business and a media entity should be dissected. Let Rappler um, answer for its lapses while it still operates as a media entity. You know, how, let's, let's draw the line. Uh, you cannot have that kind of, uh, of, 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 uh, of a serious punishment for Rappler. According to Professor Danilo Arau of UP College of Mass Communications, it is clear that the online news agency is Filipino-owned. Because if you look at the articles of incorporation and the other SEC papers of uh, Rappler, what's stated there is that it is 98% owned by RHC, or the Rep Rappler Holdings Corporation, and the uh, other, you know, percentages would be, the remaining uh, shares would be owned by the likes of Maria Reza, Chai Hopilenya, and some other personalities. Uh. The news agency is facing several cases. Now, Rappler CEO Maria Reza faces a cybercrime complaint, aside from the one which was filed by the SEC. But setting this aside, Rappler and other media organizations still have a responsibility to the public to be transparent in every transaction it enters. According to NUJP, the credibility of reporters are being tested, especially now that fake news sites are already spreading. I think uh, we ourselves, the journalists, should be transparent about our work processes. How do we gather the news? How do we, you know, how do how do we how do we make the news? Because this is uh, this is the only way to make people understand that what they're reading, what they're seeing, what they're hearing, is actually the product of a painstaking process of fact betting. Presidential Task Force on Media Security denies that this era is the most dangerous time for the members of media. We have so many media organizations in the Philippines. No? We have 436 broadcasting stations. Mm -hmm. We have 411 AM stations. We have 1,014 FM stations. And we have more than 400 newspapers. Diba? Not, not to mention the ilan yung mga bloggers natin, pro or anti-government, that, 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 are, that are free in, in speaking their minds, no? So, we're, we're, hindi ko makita eh. The task force will be intensifying the operational guidelines for media security on Wednesday, which it will disseminate throughout the country. My Bermudez, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. Malacanang calls as hearsay the report of a media organization regarding the alleged 100 million peso undeclared bank deposits and investments of President Rodrigo Duterte and his daughter, Davao City Mayor Sara Duterte Carpio. Presidential Spokesperson Secretary Harry Roque says that the recent report of Vera Files was based on unauthenticated bank statements. Roque also describes the allegations in the report as a rehash of the accusations of opposition Senator Antonio Trillanes IV. He there is a Vera Files to prove the authenticity of the documents it used in the controversial news item. The reality is the law says that bank statements are in fact confidential 
and you need a report or a request from the Anti-Money Laundering Council to get copies of these statements. When Verifiles asked me for my comment, how could I comment when the documents are not authenticated? Prove first that the statements are authentic. Then I will comment. For now, Cuento Conchero. Let's take a look at the traffic situation now along some major roads in Metro Manila. On Quezon Boulevard in Tiapo, Manila, there is a slight delay on the lane going to España Boulevard. While vehicles are fast moving on the lane going to Loton. On 5th Avenue in C3, Caloocan City, motorists are experiencing light flow of vehicles on the lane going to A. Bonifacio. The traffic is also green and go on the lane going to A. Mabini. On Marcus Highway, Santolan in Pasig City, vehicles are fast moving on the lane going to Cubao. While there is moderate flow of vehicles on the lane going to Masinag. Meanwhile, the construction of the first phase of the MRT-7 along North Avenue will begin at 11 in the evening tonight. The contractor, EEI Corporation, will begin the installation of barriers on one of the lanes of North Avenue in front of the Veterans Memorial Medical Center or VMMC. Authorities are now advising the public to expect heavier traffic flow on North Avenue and nearby areas in the following days. To address this, the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA designates alternate routes for motorists. They may fly Mindanao Avenue, Visayas Avenue, and Quezon Avenue to avoid the traffic congestion that will be caused by the construction of the MRT-7 along North Avenue. The project's contractor says the completion of the three segments of MRT-7 along North Avenue may take one year. Next on Y News. The lower house drops plan for constituent assembly to revise the constitution but vows to finish proposal for federalism without the Senate. And the government sets to finish over 1,000 temporary shelters in Sasong Song and Marawi by March this year. Why News will be right back. Representatives will no longer convene as a constituent assembly for the charter change. The House leadership also affirms that it can complete the proposed federalism without the Senate's participation. Grace Cassin will tell us why. House Speaker Pantalon Alvarez believes that a constituent assembly is no longer necessary to amend the Constitution. Pantalon adds that they can finish their version of the proposed federalism and will proceed to submit the same to the public for a plebiscite. The House leadership also says the lower chamber will not waste time waiting for the version of the Senate whose members are still in disagreement over how they are going to vote. Pantalion says the House is already working on amending the Constitution even without the participation of the Senate. So ano yung three-fourths votes of all its members? Punin mo yung bilang ng uh, congressman, punin mo yung bilang ng mga senador, itotal mo yan, doon makukuha mo yung three-fourths. Meron bang sinabi doon sa, sa Ligang Batas na kailangan mag-joint session kami? O mag-convene kami? Wala. Alvarez challenges all who questioned their decision to go and file petition to the Supreme Court. The Speaker also has this to say to the writers of the 1987 Constitution who are now questioning the charter change that the House is initiating. Eh, kasalanan nila yan eh. Itanong mo kay David yan o kay Christian Monson. O bakit hindi nyo kinumpleto yan? Trabaho nila yun eh. Tapos ngayon, tayong sisihin nila. Eh, dapat sila sisihin yan. Alvarez clarifies that they are open if the Senate wants to participate in the proposal to amend the Constitution. But if they will oppose what the House is doing, then the House will decide on its own. They target to submit the proposed federalism for a plebiscite in the May 2018 elections. Grace Kassin, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. 
The PDP Laban Federalism Institute clarifies that the decision on the issue on the term extension of President Rodrigo Duterte remains in the hands of the public. Victor Cosare will tell us why. PDP Laban Federalism Institute Chief Jonathan Malaya assures that the term of President Rodrigo Duterte will end in 2022. In an interview on the program Get It Straight with Daniel Razon, Malaya explains that since there is a transition period, the final decision on whether the term of the president should be extended or not does not depend on the administration. Oh, what if yung pung bagong balangkas na constitution states na dapat mag matapos yung transition? Ay pag ganun po at naaprobahan, no? Oh. oh, sabihin natin na uh, ang, cons ang constitutional convention, sabihin natin, ang constitutional convention, yes. ang linabas nilang uh, draft ay kailangan tapusin ng Pangulong Duterte yung, yung, transition. yung transition period at inaprobahan ng taong bayan, eh wala na po magagawa ang Pangulong okay. Duterte. Let me ask you po, sa tingin ninyo sa ganito, how long will it take to finish the transition? To answer your question, sa tingin ko, minimum of 10 years po ang magiging transition period niya. Uh, so, minimum of 10 years ang extension ng Presidente Duterte. <laughs> Hindi! <laughs> Based on the PDP Laban's version of a federal government, they will let the public decide on whether or not to remove the office of the vice president. But should the public decide to let the office of the vice president stay, Malaya says the administration might opt to reform it. We elect the president and vice president in one ticket. Uh -huh. Tapos, bigyan natin ng maliwanag na trabaho ang vice president. Okay. Kasi under our system, Spare tire lang talaga. Spare tire. At depende sa Pangulo kung anong gagawin niya. Uh -oh. So yung mga nakaraang pang pangalawang Pangulo natin, chairman ng Presidential Anti-Crime Commission, mm -hmm. yung iba naman naging HADC, mm -hmm. yung iba naging DSWD pa, iba-iba. Uh -oh. Tapos pagka ayaw ka ng presidente, tanggal ka na. Uh, ano ka na lang, at uh, membro ka ng Tunganga Brigade. You know? Correct. <coughs> Correct. So ang gusto na natin, bigyan natin siya ng tunay na trabaho at ang proposal namin... Mm. So ilalagay namin, ninyo dun yun? Yes. Uh, ang proposal niyo po? Is uh, gawin siyang uh, presiding officer ng Senado, gaya ng sistema sa US. Malaya notes they will also clearly define political dynasty in the proposed charter so it could be immediately enforced. Under the administration's proposed charter change, the country will exercise a two-party system while the party system will be replaced by a proportional representation. The PDP Laban official admits they have yet to determine the total funding needed for the charter change since they could not yet identify where to get the budget. Malaya believes shifting to a federal form of government would improve the lives of every Filipino, especially those living in provinces that usually get fewer funds. But he notes making a federal government effective depends on the people who would run it. Victor Cosare, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Several residents affected by the war in Marawi City last year will soon avail temporary shelters by March this year. Leslie Longbowen will tell us why. The National Housing Authority will build a total of 6,400 temporary shelters for residents affected by last year's Marawi siege. However, the agency targets to finish 1,170 of these units in Barangay Sagonsongan in March. The houses have a 22-square-meter floor area. Meanwhile, NHA General Manager Marcelino Escalada Jr. says he will maintain an open communication with the local government unit of Marawi for suggestions and improvements. They have requested me if and when NHA can redesign a much bigger space from 22 to 36 and with certain privacy. So we are seriously considering a bigger space for Site 2. 2,700 permanent shelters are also to be built by NHA in the city until 2021. The agency also plans to use their 7,000 square meter property in Marawi to put up five buildings for Marawi's formal sector. I think for the first time, we shall be able to provide a permanent shelter of a low-rise building in Marawi because that is also one thing that is lacking in the case of public school teachers, mga empleyado ng gobyerno ng Marawi, wala silang magandang natirahan. At present, Escalada says more or less 50% of the housing project in Marawi is finished. 500 completed units are to be presented to President Rodrigo Duterte on January 30. Leslie Longbowen, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Two local chief executives are now cleared of their alleged involvement in illegal drug trade. Malacanang says Kalinog Mayor Alex Centena and Maasin Mayor Mariano Malones of Iloilo Province 
who were both included in President Rodrigo Duterte's narco list have proven that they were not involved in any drug-related activities. Centena and Malones have recently taken their oath as new members of the Partido Democratico Pilipino, Lakas ng Bayan, or PDP Laban. I believe before they were allowed to join the PDP Laban, their names were cleared. We will not knowingly allow any drug lord to join the administration party. Meanwhile, the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency, or PDEA, reports that there are already around 5,000 barangays that are already cleared of illegal drugs. PDEA also says the initial report shows 58% or around 24,000 in more than 42,000 barangays are affected by illegal drug operations. PDEA adds that resolving illegal drugs in Metro Manila is not that easy. Well, in Metro Manila, it's still an ongoing effort. Siyempre, challenge mag-clear ng, ng drug-affected barangays anywhere, and especially in a metropolis like Manila. At talagang kailangan niya, itutukan lang, hindi ng law enforcement. But drug, barangay drug clearing is, of course, uh, an effort with the local government unit and other concerned sectors. The Philippine National Police, or PNP, arrested an Iraqi national in Angeles, Pampanga yesterday. Here's why from Lea Ilagan. An Iraqi national who managed to enter the country last year is a chemist with knowledge in making bombs and serve as a rocket consultant of the extremist group Palestine Islamic Resistance Movement. Members of the Philippine National Police in Angeles, Pampanga, Nab Taha Mohamed Al-Haburi, through an informant who reported his presence in Barangay Malabanas. Philippine National Police or PNP Chief Police Director General Ronald Bato de la Rosa says he received the said information from the Iraqi embassy prior to the arrest. Authorities say Taha Mohammed Al-Haburi has an expired visa. He was allowed to stay in the country for only 90 days, supposedly from the 10th of August to the 9th of November last year. Our only basis for taking him into custody was the alert that was given to us by the Iraqi embassy. And yet, true enough, inaamin naman niya na he's a member of the Hamas and uh, he's the uh, explosives and rocket technology consultant of the Hamas. De La Rosa claims Al-Haburi admitted being a consultant of the Palestinian group Hamas in Damascus, Syria and Istanbul, Turkey. According to him, wala, wala siyang uh, uh, terror uh, intentions here in the Philippines. Meron lang siyang business meeting dito. Related to his uh, uh, consultancy job in uh, metallurgy and uh, explosives. The PNP chief says they are not discounting the possibility that the alleged terrorist might have had planned to saw violence during the conduct of the Association of the Southeast Asian Nations Summit in the country last year. The PNP Intelligence Group is now coordinating with the Bureau of Immigration regarding the arrested Iraqi national. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue, Com. Krame. President Rodrigo Duterte sets to assign armed forces of the Philippines Chief General Rey Leonardo Guerrero as the new administrator of the Maritime Industry Authority or Marina. The president made the announcement this afternoon at the launching of an event for farmers and fishermen in Mawab, Compostela Valley. The president eyes Guerrero to replace the dismissed Marina Administrator Marco Amaro due to excessive foreign trips. Yes, Jagger. Pagkatapos niyan, siya yung mag hawak ng marina, yung pinaalis ko kasi sige travel. Jag, baka magbinangga ay ng barko di, ha? The President has earlier extended Guerrero's tour of service at the AFP until April 24, 2018. Meanwhile, the President orders the military and police forces to uphold their duties and apply the implementation of the law on him in case he violates any provisions of the Constitution, especially on his term extension. Pag ako sumubra sa aking termino isang araw lang, I am now asking the armed forces of the Philippines and the PNP not to allow me or anybody else to mess up with the Constitution.
inyong trabaho yan to protect the Constitution and to protect the people. Kako pag sumubra, gusto kong magdiktador, barilin ninyo ako. The Department of Justice has concluded its reinvestigation on the death of USC law student Horacio Atio Castillo III in an alleged hazing incident carried out by officers and members of Aegis Juris Fraternity. During today's hearing, the DOJ panel asked clar clarificatory questions on the sworn statement of Mark Anthony Ventura, an Aegis Fraternity member who served as witness in the said complaint. Ventura implicated fellow members of the fraternity who allegedly hurt Acho during an initiation rites conclude, conducted rather inside the Aegis Fraternity Library last September 17 of last year. The complaint is now submitted for resolution and DOJ panel headed by Assistant State Prosecutor Susan Villanueva will release their findings. The reinvestigation was conducted after Ventura surfaced and turned himself in and applied for witness protection program. Senator Cynthia Villar believes the Philippines can become rice self-sufficient through the use of high-tech machineries and by planting the seedlings of the fill rice. Here's why from Aiko Miguel. Senate Committee on Agriculture and Food Chairperson Cynthia Villar was the guest of honor in the 5th Uhay Festival in the Science City of Muñoz in the province of Nueva Ecija last weekend. During the said event, the lady senator says she believes the Philippines can become rice sufficient. Villar explains to do this, the government should teach Filipino farmers how to use new machineries and produce hybrid seedlings. Kaya yung po ngayong taon ng aking tinututukan na lahat sila, especially Philmec and Phil Rice kasi naniniwala po ako na pag naturuan natin ang mga farmer natin to produce yung inbred seeds na dinevelop ng Phil Rice, lalaki po ang uh, ating uh, production ng rice, magiging self-sufficient tayo sa rice. At kung may introduce din yung mga machineries, magme-mechanize sa mga farmers, marami po tayong uh, savings sa post-harvest losses na makakapagpalaki uh, ng income ng ating mga farmers. The senator also encourages farm owners to build their own farm schools to increase their income. Meanwhile, Villar says the Senate will immediately investigate any unreasonable increase in prices of products and services due to the implementation of the tax reform law. Hindi naman dapat tuma tumataas sa agad ang prices. Hindi pa na-implement ang trade, tumataan ang prices. That means, tinetake advantage ng mga tao, yung mga nasa industry na may train, kunyari, para maitaas ang prices. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. The PNP continues cruise to defend its title. Meanwhile, the NHA Builders eases to a comfortable standing. Here's why from Victor Cosare. The NHA Builders' hope for a slot in the semifinals lives on as the housing hoopsters defeated the GSIS Furies 99-88 in the first game on Sunday at the Pasig City Sports Center. Season 4 Most Valuable Player Antonio Lustestica Jr. was hailed as the best player of the game as he rallied 27 points, 4 rebounds, 1 assist and 1 block. With the loss, the Furies drops to a 5-5 win-loss standing, while the Builders are now in a comfortable spot with seven games won and two games lost. In the second game, Season 5 champion PNP Responders still holds the chance to defend the title as the Cops overpowered the Judiciary Magis 90-57. Anton Tolentino led the responders as he bucketed 19 points, grabbed 7 boards, made 2 assists and 2 steals, which held him the best player of the game. So, nag-usap-usap kami before itong January na mawawala lang ba ng ganun yung pagiging defending champion namin. Siyempre, talagang mula first quarter, tinawa namin yung guard kasi nang nawala sa amin yung defensa. With this victory, Coach Artemio Marquez's side eases to a 5-4 win-loss standing. Ang karun ng sagot yung... Pusposang practice namin nung mga nakaraang uh, araw. So, nagpapasalamat ako kay Lord sa buong team. Nanalo kami. Nabuhayan, ang buong team. Nabuhayan. 
the responders are set to face Malacanang PSC Kamao on January 28. In case the Cops win the match, they will advance to the quarterfinals. If they fail, the GSIS Furies takes the slot instead. And in the main game, Malacanang PSC Kamao defeated the Senate defenders in a neck-and-neck -neck battle 63-59 and now holds a big chance to gain the twice-to-beat advantage in the semi-final round with seven games won and two games lost. The Palace Hoopsters' strong defense limited Senate's big man Jeffrey Sanders with only eight points and Marlon De Gaspi with only four points. I just players. Like nung paglabas namin talaga sa dugout na uh, gusap-usap sila na uh, defense lang talaga para makakuha namin itong game na ito. Christian Luanzon was named the best player of the game with 14 points, 9 rebounds, 4 assists and 1 block. The Kamaos next meeting with the PNP responders is an anticipated do-or-die match for the cops. Victor Fosare, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Eliminated Wishful's battle in the first round of the Wishcovery Wild Card Edition. Here's why from Leslie Longbowen. The 16 eliminated Wishfuls of the Wishcovery have begun competing in the Wild Card Edition of the online singing contest. Alfred's Blanche of Cavite gave an emotional performance. Galing ka, pero lalo kang gagaling kung papakita ka ng something different. Chris Noel Bernalde of Bacolod performed a smooth rendition of the OPM hit, Yakap sa Dilim. Ito na ang pinakahihintay natin. Ito na tayong magkayakap sa Dilim. Bagay na bagay yung ginawa niya sa panda. But parang hindi nga pang contest yung yung kanyang Luisan Manuel of Rizal sang her own version of the song Bulag, Pipi at Bingi. felt like she was planning to do it yes. from the beginning of the song. Mm. Mm. Uh -huh. Hindi siya parang tunog. Bugso ng damdami. Yun, yun. Meanwhile, the reactors were impressed with the performance of Jenny Mae Mabini of Laguna, who won the first round of the Wishcovery Wild Card Edition. Storytelling and a build-up, right. kahit na pa ulit ulit, galing, dynamic. The second set of Wishcovery wildcard contestants will compete next weekend. The winner of the wildcard edition will be part of the Wishful Five. They will compete in the grand finals of the biggest and freshest online singing competition in the country, the Wishcovery. <laughs> Leslie Lumboen, UN TV News and Rescue, Philippines. Those are the reasons behind the news January 22nd, 2018. I am William Theo. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I'm Berlin Basingan. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Thank you for watching. Why, why News? news?